Good morning, everybody. Apologies for the folks that got bounced to the wait the waiting room initially. We were just handling some logistics here and didn't want people to sit there and be bored by our conversation. Anyway, I'm so excited to see the people that we have here today. And welcome to Authentic Assessment in STEM courses. My name is Brandon Gaynor. I'm the Acting Director of Professional Development with CBC at One. And I'm pleased to introduce our wonderful facilitator, Suzanne Joaquin, who will give a self-intro in the moment, but just a couple of steps to handle beforehand. First off, if you do have a question, our facilitators just ask that you put two question marks uh, in the chat when you pose the question. So Chitarado and I, my colleague, will be monitoring the chat and keeping track of questions. We'll also have a few breakpoints in the webinar itself that you will be able to address those questions. Now, during the webinar, we'll also be linking to a survey for you to provide feedback. We'll be dropping into the chat after about 30 minutes and then roughly every 15 minutes after that. Please fill this out so that we can know how we did, our facilitator can know how they did, and so we can create programming that's more tailored to the needs of the system moving forward. The last thing I want to note here is that while At One does provide badges as proof of completion for our courses, we don't provide a badge for completing or attending this webinar. But if your institution does require proof of attendance for flex credit, professional advancement, or other matters, please remain until the end of the webinar complete the survey, and make sure you click that little button that says request a copy of your responses through the Google form. You can use that as confirmation and proof of your attendance, but if your institution needs a little bit more than that because they do vary, please send us an email at support at cbc.edu, which we will drop in the chat shortly. Now I'll turn it over to Suzanne, who will introduce herself and start with the webinar. Thanks, Brandon. Um, I'm Suzanne Joaquim. A little bit of background on me. I am a biology faculty at Butte College up in Northern California. I've been here for, I think, almost 20 years, and I've taught a, a wide variety of the biology courses. I'm also currently the uh, Student Learning Outcomes and Distance Ed Coordinator. And that's um, relevant to this because the focus of authentic assessment really came from the connection between all of those different roles. So having the hat of SLOs and having, you know, kind of distance ed training and different courses is how this presentation really came to be. I also have a few other roles. Um, I am a course facilitator for At One. I facilitate um, assessment design, equitable grading, and um, accessibility. And I am also on the DECO team and working with the um, Academic Senate's OER initiative. So do a bunch of stuff. For this particular session, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at kind of fixed assessments, which is the um, the other side of adaptive assessments. So I, I just wanted to have kind of terminology for those two types of assessments. We'll look at some of the confounding variables for fixed assessments and how to transition those to more adaptable. There's gonna be a lot of chance for interactivity. So you can, if you have the chat open, you'll have an opportunity to, to answer questions in the chat, which is why I, um, I'm requesting that you put two question marks before you pose a question, because otherwise it might get lost. At the very end of the session, I'll share a link to a, a worksheet that I created that can help folks think through how do I transition my current assessments to ones that are a bit more authentic or adaptable. I tend to use those two terms um, interchangeably, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. All right, first um, opportunity for interactivity. What is the purpose of assessment? So in the chat, um, why do we do assessments? To assess understanding of materials, right? To understand what students know and to verify that they understand it. Right. Also a great measurement tool, right? We have to grade students. That's part of what we do. And assessments can help us measure where on the scale of, of learning that they are. Um, I love that to, to see if what we're teaching sticks, right? So a lot of times the assessment is assessing what students know, but it's equally effective to help us understand if what we're doing is working. 
because um, if a lot of students are getting the same answer incorrect, maybe we start looking at how we're presenting that information. To gather baselines, right? Pre-assessments are wonderful to kind of get a sense of where are my students coming in with an understanding. It's part of the learning process, absolutely. So that's a, a really important piece of it is assessments can be, um, well, that's formative assessments, but summative assessments too. Idea being students answer some sort of questions, you respond and that can help them learn. So it, it is important part of the learning process itself. Excellent. So I think we got most of these, but I wanted to make sure to address kind of the three main purposes for assessment, right? One is measurement, understanding how, you know, knowing what students know, being able to give them a grade and helping students see where they are in their learning. The second one is learning, right? So that's, again, the, the formative assessment piece where students complete something, you give them feedback, maybe they can revise it, and that cycle can help them really learn the material much better than if we just tell them they take a test and then we both walk away. And then collaboration. I really love thinking about assessments as collaboration with my students, especially in online classes, because when, um, why well, I should say this, I've had some of the most in-depth conversations with students in the comments field of the gradebook. I have my um, notifications set to getting those comments instantly. And so when I grade an assignment, I leave students some comments, they respond and then I respond. And it actually ends up being almost like a chat, a chat session back and forth instantly. And why that's so effective, I think, is because it's focused on a specific bit of information. And because the way that my assessments are, which I'll explain in a minute, it really helps the student see where their gaps are, where there's some misunderstanding. And then we can work together in that comments area to help them revise their assignments so that they really understand the information. So I, I treat my assessments and online classes as very much a collaborative effort between me and my students. And I should mention um, this worked particularly well when I transitioned to having the assessments be revisable. And so then students are really focused on understanding the learning because they know that they can do something by asking questions and understanding they can revise and increase their grade, as opposed to assessments where they're just done. And like, why would they read through that if they're not gonna do anything with the feedback that you're giving them? The goal for what I'm gonna talk about here is creating assessments that have two important factors. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about adaptable assessments. The idea here is that these are assessments that students can adapt in a way that makes the best sense for them. So they're still demonstrating their knowledge, but there's a lot of flexibility in the assessment so that students can demonstrate their knowledge in a way that is most effective for how they learn and how they present information. This really goes back to principles of UDL, if you've seen those, right? One of the principles is um, action and expression, right? And the idea is giving students options in how they express their learning. So that's the adaptability. Equally important though, is accuracy, right? So a lot of times when we think about assessments and measurement, we wanna make sure that what we're assessing is what we think we're assessing. Not just for the part of grading the student, but also so that we know how we're doing. We wanna make sure that those assessments match up with our goals for the assessment. And I'll explain that in a minute. So our goals for this session. We're going to, for this section, um, we're going to look at two types of outcomes. One is a learning outcome that is kind of lower level blooms, right? So it's a um, kind of remember and understand level. And then we're also going to look at an outcome that is higher level blooms, where they're asked to really analyze and put together different bits of information. And for both of these, we'll look at traditional fixed assessments and those how those can be change to more authentic and adaptable assessments. Okay, 
So let's look at our first learning outcome. First learning outcome is uh, something that is in every intro biology class ever. It's usually chapter three in the book, right? It's all of the macromolecules that make up life. And it's a pretty low level blooms in that they are asked to kind of understand what those things are and group them together. So they have to be able to know what each of those chemicals is, what it looks like, and which larger grouping it belongs to. Or, um, this is a common learning outcome, I think, for a lot of courses. So this session is particularly focused on STEM, but um, all of these strategies can be used in a variety of different courses, because I think most disciplines have terminology that students need to learn. So that's really what we're talking about here, vocabulary. So here's a, um, a traditional assessment. And this is one that I used for many years. And I love this assessment question because it, it gets at so much. So let me walk you through it and then I'll explain why I thought this was just a brilliant question. So this is on a multiple choice test. The question says, which relationship is different? And they have to choose between those four options, phospholipid and lipid, amino acid and protein, monosaccharide, polysaccharide, and monosaccharide, disaccharide. What's really nice about this is we often think about multiple choice tests as only being able to measure lower level understanding. This is really asking students to put that information together and um, be able to analyze comparison. So this is taking them up in the Bloom's taxonomy. Here's a problem though. For um, a few semesters in a row, I would have students come to me and ask the question, why are we dividing these chemicals? And the first time a student came up to me, I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was really confused, right? Um, and, and he said, well, there, that's a, a division symbol. Why are we dividing them? And I thought, oh, yeah. Um, you know, I kind of, the first one I was like, okay, well, that's, um, that's unfortunate that you don't know that. This was many years ago. I'm trying to be kind to myself, but I did not have a very helpful response. I was like, oh, honey, did no one tell you? But after a few semesters of multiple students asking me that question, I realized nobody told them. Like they didn't learn this particular terminology. Um, and I really had to look at my privilege. I came from a high school where we had a lot of AP classes. It was assumed we would all be going to college and we learned this game. Like I know what this means. I know we're comparing things. But for a lot of our students, this question was literal nonsense. And so they had no way to demonstrate their knowledge because they didn't understand what I was asking. And so what I actually was assessing with this information, with this question, is what high school did they go to, right? And that's not what I intended to assess. So that's really what I'm talking about when I say that what we want to focus on is ensuring that we are assessing what we think we're assessing. So I'm going to pause and in the chat, what other confounding variables do you see with this assessment? So this is an in-class multiple choice test. What other confounding variables, what other things might I be assessing that I don't intend to assess? I'm going to give you a minute to think. What else am I assessing here? Yeah, good guessing is a, it's a great one. So if we went to call, uh, schools where they taught us, you know, the testing games, um, if you don't know, you do know, check C or, you know, um, the vocabulary relationship, is that a vocabulary term that is part of what I'm teaching them or not? If they don't know what relationship means, I had a, um, 
I used to always use the word offspring for my genetics. Um, and I realized students don't know what offspring means. It's a great band, but they didn't connect it to what I was asking them. So understanding those vocabulary um, pieces that are not directly related to our discipline is, is important. Important uh, in interpretation of what I mean when I say relationship. And so Tatiana, exactly, I'm assessing proficiency in English which doesn't happen to be my SLO, right? This really comes down to what is the goal of my particular class? Good linguistic skills is important. It just doesn't happen to be part of what I'm tasked with teaching students. And it's a confounding variable because now I don't know if the student got this wrong because they have language gaps or because they don't understand the chemistry. So I'd get great analysis, but I couldn't do anything with that because I didn't have any way of assessing why the student got the question wrong. A few of the other confounding variables with this kind of assessment is if it's timed in any way, it assesses students' speed of recall. Now, speed is important if you're teaching something like EMS, like I absolutely want them to have that instant speed of recall. But if that's not part of my assessment, it's another confounding variable because I'm assessing speed, not just understanding. There's also things um, related to test anxiety. It's, it, I don't know if you've all have done this, but I know I do. When I'm in a quiz in Canvas and it used to have that clock right there that was counting down, I had such a hard time reading through the questions because the clock was all encompassing and it was this added cognitive load of increasing my stress, which meant I couldn't demonstrate my knowledge. So with all of those confounding variables, it means that the test and the grade that a student gets on the test isn't a direct assessment of their knowledge. It's an assessment of all of these other confounding variables as well. And we've all experienced this where there's a student that is really great in class, you talk to them, they get it, and they like fail the test. And that, that's why it's all the confounding variables. So what's the alternative? The alternative to this particular kind of, of SLO, right? So we're talking about kind of lower level SLOs, but this will work for, for most of them. You want to start by identifying the learning outcome clearly to the student. Right, so if you've gone through um, the poker process for your class, you know, this is one of the things that you wanna do is on a module, on an assignment, clearly tell students, here is the thing that you're learning. And so for my assignment for this one, I tell them what you wanna demonstrate is that you know what each of these things means and you know how they're grouped together. That is your goal. And then you wanna provide a clear and detailed rubric. This will make it easier for you to grade the assignment. It'll also make it easier for the students to understand what they're supposed to be doing. So there's not a lot of guesswork. And so the, the rubric is a really wonderful learning tool that I hope you're using in your Canvas shells. If you're not, I would encourage you to take a look at those rubrics. and then let students select how they demonstrate that knowledge. So the way that my particular course is set up is I actually start each module with the assessment. This is what you're learning this week. And so when they're reading through the content in the book or online or whichever resources they're using, they always have a goal and they know what the goal is because I've told them that in the first bullet, right? This is what you're learning. And I found that really helps students to not read the textbook like it's a novel, right? A lot of times our students just read the book and they think that is going to help them learn. But if they don't have a goal for what they're reading and why they're reading it, it can be really difficult for them to piece out the information that's important. So I start with, here's your goal. Here's what you're gonna show me. And then here are some resources to help you figure out how that information makes sense to you. What do students come up with? 
So I have um, some student samples. I will say that these are um, from students, which means they're not all correct, right? Um, and I'll talk about why that matters in a minute. One of the ways that a lot of students do this particular assignment is they have the larger grouping and they define what that is. And then they have the smaller groupings kind of nested underneath. And below this would be another large grouping and then smaller groupings. Another approach that students take is kind of these tables. And this particular table has the groupings on the right and the components of each group on the other way, on the other column, at the right and left backwards, sorry. Um, now you'll notice that for this particular approach, this is showing part of the outcome, but not all of the outcome, right? So they're showing the groupings, but they're not telling me the definitions. And I've told them that that's okay too. If you wanna separate those two tasks, you can do that. So for this particular student, they may also create flashcards, right? Where there's the definitions of each um, term, but this doesn't demonstrate the groupings. So they've separated those two parts of the outcome, which is fine. I also have students that will write this out by hand, which I always found fascinating because I've been teaching online, well, I don't know, 10, 15 years, something like that. And so in the, in the old days, um, these were students that were specifically taking online classes because that's what they wanted or needed. And I found lots and lots of students just learn better by handwriting. That's fine. You know, I tell them as long as you, I can read your handwriting, that is a good approach. And then some students will um, create like mind maps, which are a really great way to connect the information. You can see each branch here is the larger grouping with the definition, oops, sorry, and then smaller groupings from there. Okay. Benefits. I'm assessing the SLO directly. So there's, there's no confounding variables here because students get to choose how they demonstrate their knowledge. And so they're demonstrating it in the way that it makes sense to them. So there's nothing else other than the, the pure knowledge that they're showing me. So if English isn't their comfort point, they can use um, flashcards where there's not a lot of writing. Students are focused on learning the content rather than the form, right? So if I'm asking a student to write an essay, a lot of their cognitive load is going towards writing the essay as opposed to what they're writing about. So by giving them these choices, students can focus just on the learning because they can connect it in whatever way that makes sense. This one was um, one that I was a little surprised by when I first started going um, using the authentic assessments. This was such a wonderful way to identify misconceptions. When we create something like a multiple choice test, the only misconceptions there are the ones that we can envision, right? We're giving them the misconceptions that we think they, they have. What we're missing is that open flexibility, which brings in an amazing variety of misconceptions in a wonderful and beautiful way. So there's been a lot of times where students turn in um, an assignment where there's a brand new misconception that never occurred to me. Um, and that's a really great way to help me develop the class so that I can address that misconception. But it's also a really important way for me to help that student learn. Because if I wasn't ident able to identify that misconception, I couldn't teach them properly because I didn't know what they didn't know, right? And if you don't know what you don't know, you're not gonna be able to get where you need to go. So this way really helps me identify what it is that one particular student, where their gap is. And as I mentioned before, this is really helpful for universal design for learning. This is kind of the baseline of how to do um, adaptable course design and authentic assessments. If you haven't looked up um, UDL in the past, cast.org is a really great site that explains, put that in the chat, 
explains how universal design for learning can help us develop courses that meet the most variety of student needs. And one of those pieces is multiple means of action and expression, which is allowing students to demonstrate what they know, just like I've mentioned, in whatever way that works best for them. Multiple means of engagement is the idea that we allow students to enter the, the, the content in a way that is most engaging for them. So not making assumptions about what we think our students will find engaging. For a lot of my assignments, um, I've had students work with family members on the assignment, which is such a wonderful way to engage the, the people that you live with in your, um, in your coursework. So I've had parents that will create stuff with their kids, right? So they'll have the kid create little pictures and the parent will label it. Um, like what a wonderful way to connect with your child while also continuing with your education. This semester, I have a student that for his assignments, he explains the concepts to his sister who's in high school. And so they're bonding over, over biology, which I think is, is really wonderful. So the, the students are engaging in the way that makes sense for them. The last piece of UDL is multiple means of representation, which is giving students options in how they learn the information. So this isn't part of this presentation, so I won't go into the details there, but it's the idea that just having a textbook means that the students who learn best with a textbook are the ones that are going to learn best. Also providing some videos or some interactive elements helps other students also learn the information in a way that, that works best for how their brains think. So that's that one. Here's an important piece to this. Because whenever I talk about giving students options in how they demonstrate their knowledge, a lot of the questions I get are about rigor. Doesn't this reduce rigor? And, um, and it actually, not only does it not reduce the rigor, it increases it because I can ask my students to do more complex thinking because I'm, I'm I wanna say this. So if I take away the cognitive load related to test taking or essay writing or whatever it might be, I can use that brain power to help them move higher up in their understanding of biology. So I found even with my non-major students, I can push them into really complex topics because they get to learn them in the way that works best for them. So I'm not changing the rigor of the course, increasing it, but not decreasing it for sure. And I'm not changing the content. I'm not asking my students to learn less information. The choices they get is how they learn the information and how they present their knowledge. So the image on the slide here is um, a map going from, I think, Sacramento to Reno. Um, and if you, you know, when you do maps, you can see that there's multiple pathways that you can get there. You're still going to the same endpoint. You just get to choose how you get there. That's really how you want to think about this particular approach to assessment design. Some important considerations. You wanna make sure that you scaffold this learning. Because if you just tell students, and I, and I did this so I can speak with, um, with a definite understanding that if you just tell students, show me what you, what you know in the way that works best for you, they're going to get lost and overwhelmed. So you need to scaffold this. What I do is in the first few assignments, I give them examples, right? So in the chemistry assignment, I actually give them exactly the slides that I gave you. You can show it with a table, you can show it with an outline, you can show it with a mind map. And that really helped the students know that, um, well, essentially for the first couple of assignments they pick. I like that one, I'm gonna do that, which is great, right? And then later on in the semester, I encourage them to try different strategies. This is less about biology, but more about their future learning, right? So if you get in the rut of always doing um, the, the same thing, always doing an outline. You're missing an opportunity for developing how you can learn, developing that ability of, of learning content. And so one for one of my later assignments, which is um, 
the nervous system. That tends to be the hardest one for students. These are gen ed students. And so what I have them do is for the first assignment, same thing, do it however you like to do it. And then in the next module, I have them do it again in a different way. If you wrote an essay, draw a diagram. If you did a diagram, do a flow chart, as long as you're doing something different. And again, the, the rubric is super important. It helps students know what to do and it helps grade, make grading easier. One of the questions I get a lot about, um, about this particular approach is, doesn't that make grading harder because there's all of these different approaches? And with a good rubric, it's not any harder because I, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those definitions and I can find them in all sorts of different ways. And what I found is this actually makes grading easier because, and this, this part may just be me, but I think it's a lot of us. If I have a stack of essays, about three or four essays in, I'm, I'm bored and I'm grumpy and I need to walk away so that my fifth student doesn't get a lower grade, right? With this sort of approach, every assignment has just a little bit of novelty. And, you know, our brains are wired for novelty. And so I get just a little bit of a boost in every new assignment because there's this moment of like, what are they going to do? Um, and every once in a while, a student does some fabulous drawing that just re-energizes me. And so I found that I can actually grade for a lot longer before I need to take a break for, for my own, um, kind of clear my mind. I'll share some links at the end of the, the last slide, but one of the really helpful tools that I found is um, this project called Tilt Transparency in Learning and Teaching. And this discusses how to write these assignments so that they're very clear for students so that they're doing the work that they need to do accurately. And so I'll, I'll put the link later, but I would encourage you to take a look at that to help you write these assignments um, clearly. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to pause for questions. So in the chat, or if you wanna raise your hand and ask verbally, what questions do you have so far? doing the 15 second thing, boy, that's hard. Okay, no questions, awesome. Great question. So um, do I use this in my traditional classes or primarily online? Uh, this is for, for my online classes. I actually don't teach face-to-face. -face, um, so I, I only teach online and this is that's where I use this, yeah. Uh, great question, Erin. Do I have any suggestions for how um, one might encourage the rest of the department to consider this approach? This can be a, a really difficult topic because it's asking us to break away from how we've always thought about assessments, right? Especially in the STEM fields, we've we've been assessed pretty similarly. I remember my, you know, hundred plus auditorium with a multiple choice Scantron. And because we're often not taught how to teach, and I need to be careful how I say this because some people certainly are, but when we hire people at the community colleges, we're hiring them for content expertise rather than because of how much, um, you know, they don't necessarily have a master's in education, right? They have a master's in their discipline. And so it can be really hard to do something other than what, how you learned, right? And y'all remember this, when you first start teaching, the, the, you know, your mentor gives you their lecture notes and gives you their assessments and says, this will help you. And so of course, we're going to create the assessments in the way that, that we know how to create them. One of the strategies that I would encourage you to use in your 
in your department meetings is, um, and I'll have this worksheet at the end of, of the session, is to share, share that particular worksheet. And what that essentially talks about is looking at your current assessments and asking the question, what are the confounding variables in this assessment? So really doing a deep dive into what am I actually assessing? Because we're often not assessing what we think we are. And then ask the question, how else could I assess this? What options can I give students for demonstrating this particular piece of knowledge? And that can be helpful, especially the confounding variables because our, our, our STEM colleagues, um, we need to see, see data, right? We need to see kind of the, the evidence. And so if you can walk through how our current assessments are flawed, then we can start thinking about how can we make them better? So another great question in the Q&A forum, and then I'll get back to the, the chat. Um, what do you say to a colleague who argues that you're not preparing students for how other professors run their courses, which are more traditional? That's a really great question. This also tends to come up a lot in our CTE programs where what we're teaching students is to um, pass a, a, a certifying board exam, right? And this is where you really want to step back and think about your goal for that assessment. If my goal for that assessment is to train students for the board exams and the board exams are multiple choice, absolutely, I'm going to have multiple choice in my test because that is my learning outcome. However, if your goal is to teach content, then there's other ways to do that. Now, you can also do both. And here's how you can approach doing both. The example I gave for, for the nervous system where I have students do it in the um, adaptable strategy, kind of whatever you want to show me, show it that way. The second way, the second time they have to do that, right? The second um, time they're, I'm asking them to complete the nervous system assignment, I can give them a multiple choice test. Or if I really want to make sure that they can write essays, I can say write an essay. Or... Um, Another one that I, I really think is important for at least for STEM disciplines is creating diagrams, right? So much of our information is visual. So the second time I can ask them to create a diagram. Now, here's why that it's important to do these separately, because that'll help me assess what students know the first time, what they know about the nervous system. The second time I can work with them to teach them how to transfer their knowledge to this particular way of assessing. Okay, lots in the chat. Um, yeah. I, I think I can manage. Um, many of the traditional assessments are machine graded. Um, grading using a rubric will increase workload. Um, what are your strategies to balance this increased workload? Absolutely. So this will take more time to grade than a Scantron. Run hundreds of Scantrons in a minute. The way that I um, I approach this is I have um, I have weekly assignments that are relatively small, and so that I can grade them little bits at a time. That that's my approach, but it, it's also worth noting that this approach will take longer than Scantrons. That it, it is what it is, right? And so, if you have um, classes where you're serving two to four hundred students, you won't be able to do this for all of the assignments, right? You, you'll still just for sheer um, hours in the day, you can't have more than 24, you'll probably still need to use traditional assessments for some things. But think about the concepts, maybe the concepts that are most important and have students do those in, um, in more adaptable ways. Or another really great strategy is to have students grade each other. Peer review is such a wonderful skill to teach students. So I don't have to grade everything. I can have students grade each other and that way they're they're learning too. It's a twofer, right? They're learning the content, they're learning about peer review and um, it saves me time. So that's one of the strategies. Although if, others, uh, if other folks have strategies for um, saving time with that, please put them in the chat. I'm always happy to learn more. Excellent question. Um, where can I find examples of authentic assessments for solving math equations? 
I don't know that I have an answer to like a specific place that you can go to find examples. Um, that may be worth talking to your colleagues. Math is a, a particularly wonderful discipline in that you all have like statewide meetings, which I'm so jealous. We don't have that in, in biology. So connecting with that group that, that puts together the, the statewide meetings would be a, a good way to start having these conversations. Oh, do I have good examples of rubrics? I did not include those. So before these slides are shared, um, and I'm saying this out loud, so maybe Sochi and Brandon, you can remind me because I'll forget. Um, I'll, I'll add a few example rubrics to, to the slides. Yep, we can do that for you. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So let's move on to a different kind of um, level of, of Bloom's taxonomy. Oh, sorry. Let me, there's one more thing in the chat. Let me address that. I thought about clarifying this. I'm not a math faculty, I see. I'm an instructional designer here to learn how to help my STEM colleagues. Yeah, for, for math, encourage them to connect to, um, to, to math folks. Connecting to our, our, our faculty across the state in our own discipline is gonna be the best way to get specific examples in what we teach, right? So these are biology specific examples because that's what I teach. I think a lot of this can be transferred over to a lot of different disciplines. But if you want those very specific examples, I would encourage you to kind of reach out to, to people um, and, and not just you, Susan, I meant just everybody in general. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the worksheet at the end will also help with, it really comes down to thinking about how else can students demonstrate this knowledge? It's not necessarily, like my assignments, I can share the very specific wording I use for my students. Um, my assignments aren't really, you can kind of drop in any discipline to the assignment because what it says is, here's what you're learning. Here's how I'm grading you. Off you go. Like that's the, that's the extent of it, right? Because that gives them the flexibility. Um, Jane, that's a really great question. I actually, if anyone is here from math and knows what that, I just know they have every year they have a conference, but if anyone knows the specific name of that group, that would be great. Excellent. All right, so let's, and um, Anna, thank you for sharing that link to um, resource for authentic assessment, it's wonderful. So let's take a look at a different kind of learning outcome, higher level blooms, explain a process. So this is my nervous system assignment. Um, you don't need to read all that. It basically says, explain how the nervous system works in this very specific way. So you're looking at a pen and you wanna pick it up just to give them some context and include all of these vocabulary terms. So that's the, the process, right? If you have students, if the assignment says, write an essay explaining the nervous system, and we talked about this before, what you're really assessing is their language skills, their ability to express themselves in written format, which is important. And I'm not saying that we don't wanna do that. But if you do both of these together, you can't tell if the reason they got the grade is because of their, their language skills or because of their understanding. And I'm sure you've all seen this when you've had essays before where I can't figure out what the student is saying. Like I, I just can't even get to the point of grading if their biology information is correct. The, the sentence structure is so confusing that I just can't get to point B, right? And so by having them write essays, we're really limiting the ability for them to demonstrate their science knowledge. Okay, so how else can we assess something? If you were a, a student and you're asked to explain um, the nervous system, how else might you be able to show that other than an essay?
Yeah, draw draw the pathway. This is a really visual concept, right? And so a lot of my students will draw pictures showing this, um, create videos, infographics, um, a list. Lists are really popular. That tends to be how my brain works is I like the step-by-step -step numbered list. Um, and so when we first do this particular kind of assignment, again, I show them examples. To explain a process, you can do a list, an infographic, a diagram. Um, in my example, I show them the diagram as being really rudimentary because my drawing skills are, are like nil. Um, and so I can tell them, here's what I would have drawn. So don't feel bad about like if your drawings aren't picture book perfect, right? So I've had um, students do flowcharts, list, hand-drawn pictures. Um, I've also had students find a diagram of the process, put it into a, um, there's these really great online tools for creating games, right? And so one of them is like a hotspot thing where you put your diagram and you have to put the right words in the right place. And I've had students create those. And that is an option I give them. You know, I do tell them you can't just cut and paste from the textbook and say, here's my answer. But if you've done something with that, like create a game, that works. Um, a few semesters ago, I had a student that would create picture books with her son, which was so much fun. And they'd be like, she used turtles to explain protein synthesis, which just blew my mind because it was, it was right. It was very good. The turtle was the ribosome and there was all these things happening. And it was, it was beautiful. And it was a time for her to spend with her son. And now out in the world, there's like an eight-year-old kid that understands protein synthesis. What could be better, right? Um, and lots of students that do, you know, video, audio. I will say most of my students will do essays. That's what they're used to. That's what they're comfortable with. That's fine too. I do ask them further down the class to try something different, expand your, your horizons just a little bit. But if that's what they're comfortable with, that's okay too. So some assessment options, just to make sure I didn't miss any. Um, multimedia presentations. Case studies. So this is one where you could rather than, so this isn't saying students would create a case study. But you could have for part of your assessment case studies where students need to work through things. These are really great authentic assessments because they are what's happening in, in the world, right? This is particularly useful if you're teaching like pre-allied health classes where your students are going to go into allied health or some other CTE field. Helping them think through what they will be doing in their later careers using the concepts in our class is such a wonderful way for them to make those connections. So case studies are a really great approach for authentic assessment. Back to the, the question about kind of saving time, case studies are a really great place to also have students do peer review, right? Work together and figure out the case study. Um, I have one assignment that isn't exactly a case study, but it's um, it's a discussion board where students have to answer some pretty complex questions about neurotransmitters. Again, this is a, a GE level class, and I used to never be able to take students this far, but because I'm reducing um, the cognitive load of the assessment strategies, I can ask them to figure out if this neurotransmitter is an agonist or an antagonist, if it's catabolic or anabolic or whatever it might be. That's for the enzyme one, never mind. But what I have them do for those is in the discussion board, the, each student picks a different neurotransmitter. They answer the questions as best they can. The other students in their group, and this is done in smaller discussion board groups, the other students give them feedback on the assignment using um, sources, right? So they have to cite their sources. This part of your answer is correct, and I found it here. Or if the first student isn't sure about something, I encourage them to ask a question. I couldn't find this answer. The next student will say, I found your answer and I found it here, right? So that citing sources is really important. And then the third part of it is the, the student gives me their final answer. This is so easy to grade. 
because I'm pretty sure they got all the right answers. So I can kind of skim through it. And it's it's a, a list of questions, so it's pretty easy to, to read through. And because they've helped each other, my load of grading is much reduced, right? Because I think you've experienced this too. An assignment that is correct, super easy to grade. It's when the assignments are incorrect that you have to kind of really think about what's, what's happening. But because of that structure, 90% of my students get everything right on the last time. So it makes it really easy to grade and saves a lot of time. And it's a lot of learning for students. Other strategies are portfolios. Um, so one of my anatomy colleagues has a similar structure for her, her classes where she has them do kind of more fluid things for each of the assignments. And overall, what they're doing is they're building um, a portfolio for each of the body systems. So this is a class for students that are going into nursing. And when they get there, they have a portfolio that explains all of the, the um, body systems in a way that they can find easily. It's really wonderful. So this is an assignment where they will use it in the future. Um, collaborative learning, as I mentioned, is kind of peer review. You can also have students do annotations. So in your textbook, if you have um, a digital textbook, you can download something like Hypothesis or Perusal and have assignments where students are marking up the textbook together to help each other learn the content. Right. So one student might post this is confusing and another student would find a video to help explain that. Really great way to build community, which, in, you know, in online classes can be difficult, but this is a, um, a low barrier entry into building some really wonderful community. Study resources. Um, you can have students create study resources for each other. Another really great um, authentic assessment. And all of these that I'm talking about are um, are what are called renewable assignments. So if you've if you've learned about open educational practices, the idea here is you're helping students create assignments that they're going to use in the future. Assignments that are engaging to them, because what we don't want is we've all had this. So so raise your hand either mentally or um, or on Zoom. If at the end of high school, you had a pile of papers in the bottom of your backpack that were like three years old and, and soggy and you never looked at them again because you got them back, you shoved them in your backpack and then promptly forgot about it. I can't possibly be the only one. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, those are disposable assignments, right? Like you, you write the thing. The teacher gives you feedback. You're never going to do anything again with it. Why would I read the feedback, right? So it's really all about assignments where students are going to be either using the assignment in the future or they have buy-in because they're creating study resources for their peers or they're revising the assignment so they have buy-in to read those feedback because otherwise a whole bunch of learning is missed. So benefits and considerations. Benefit, as before, this accurately assesses synthesis knowledge, right? Because I'm not trying to um, create synthesis questions in multiple choice, which are, are really kind of difficult to do. And it creates these wonderful teachable moments. I mentioned this before with the misconceptions. It is really fascinating to out where students have gaps in knowledge that I never would have dreamed about. So it's a really great teachable moment. As we mentioned before, writing and test taking skills are important. So yes, if you want to teach those skills and that is a conscious component of your assessment, then I would encourage you to separate that out from the content knowledge, right? So have one assessment for assessing what they know about the content and then another assignment where you're helping them create that written or that test taking skill so that they can develop that. But do those separately and always be really um, cognizant of what exactly are you? Because if you want to assess test taking skills, great, do that. But know what you're assessing is test taking. 
I mentioned the um, the benefits of peer review. This is such a wonderful way to one limit how much work you have to do, which is lovely, and it's an also a great skill for for students. But you need to provide training. This is not something that students come in knowing. Um, having worked with colleagues, this is not something we come in knowing, right? So providing that training of how do you provide helpful feedback um, and how do you, you know, how to do peer review is really important. If you don't know how to um, provide this training, I would encourage you to talk to our colleagues in communication studies. That is one of their skill sets. And that's actually where I got my, my training in peer review feedback. Um, so great to connect with colleagues. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, self-evaluation is another wonderful way to limit how much work you have to do. And of course, a really wonderful skill to teach students. Excellent. So yeah, just reach out to Brandon if you need help on, um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Please do not give me more work. <laughs> um, so Self-evaluation is a really great skill for students to have as well. One of the, the assignments I have, and I probably should do this for all of my assignments, I just haven't, is to ask students, how do you think you did? I actually have a, a colleague in computer science that does it this way. Do your assignment, and at the very end, you tell me how you think you did. And they're often pretty good about assessing, like, I think I, think I got it kind of, but there were some gaps. And that'll help you look for what to grade because um, then, you, then you already know going in, like the student already identified this is their confusing point. So let me read that piece better or more clearly, more deeply. And having that metacognitive skill is so important for students, right? We've, we've all had the students that come to us after a test and are like completely confused about why they didn't do well. And so, helping them understand to like really assess what you know, um, that's a skill and that's a, a skill worth teaching. Just like, you know, writing skills, test taking skills, those metacognitive skills are super important. Thank you. Um, so yeah, seconding that strategy, it, it's, it's really helpful. It's helpful for me to grade, it's helpful for the student, it's an important skill. Okay, so actually before I move on to this, because this is another little section, are there any questions so far? Okay. So this particular strategy is something that I've only recently started implementing. I think this is my second semester. And it was something I added as a way to prevent cheating. So it was one of those, um, it was going to be logistic and not very fun kind of additions to my classes. It made me sad. Um, but what I found is this has been amazing. Um, and so I really wanted to just share this strategy as something for, for you to think about. This is a, um, a component of every assignment that I have. And what it asks students to do is identify where they found the information with citations. Um, and this was how I started it. Like, I just wanted to know where they were getting the information from so I could ensure that they weren't just cutting and pasting. What I added though, is to, for them to explain their learning process. So how did they progress through the assignment? Where did they run into challenges and how did they overcome the challenges? What I'm asking students to do here, and I still need to figure out how to get them to do this better. I'm still getting a lot of students that just list the, the resources they use. And that's not exactly what I want them to do. What I want them to do is to say, this is the resource I went to first. Here are the pieces of the assignment I found there. Here's what's still missing. Here are the resources I found to, to um, answer those missing pieces. 
This semester, I've added some more examples and explanation and scaffolding, so I'm getting better responses to this. And when students do this correctly, it's such an amazing insight into how they're learning the material. And it really helps me get into, here's, here's where your gap was and here's where you found um, the error that you made, right? And I've also had students mention that this is helpful to them because it's, it's meant to just be a note-taking thing. As you're learning this big complex, how does the nervous system work? You need to keep track of your learning. That's important for a variety of you know, things in our life. Keep track of what you're doing so you don't get lost. And so I tell them, this is just a note-taking tool. Tell me where you went, tell me what you did, tell me what you still needed to do. It doesn't have to be pretty, um, but just keep track. Some of the benefits. It's helpful for students, so it helps them track what they're trying to do. Um, because with, with the assignments that I have, they're pretty broad and students can get lost in the assignment. And so this really helps them keep track of their content. Great question, Lynn. How much of the learning, how, how much does the learning journal contribute to the course grade? So the answer is both 0% and 100%. What I tell students is, well, what, what I do, is what I tell them, but if you don't do this section of the assignment, I won't grade your assignment until you go back and do it. Um, but it doesn't actually contribute to, to their grade um, once I'm grading the assignment, but is an absolute requirement for me to grade the assignment. This helps students with metacognitive skills. We've mentioned why that's important. It helps them learn how to approach difficult topics because I'm helping them break down learning strategies that they may not be coming in with, right? So if they're given a big, broad topic and they get confused, a lot of times students will just, it's too much, right? It's overload and they walk away. This helps them really break it down because they're finding a resource and then just identifying what they got out of that resource. So helping them break down learning is an important skill that, that this helps with. Also helps me learn how to um, understand how to help each student because I can see where their gaps are. I can see where they need particular help. Sometimes students will um, cite less than ideal resources and therefore will have pretty wildly inaccurate answers. And then I can help them understand that this is probably not a good resource because it led you to the wrong answer. Here's a better resource. Um, another part of the, the course that I'm not going to talk about here too much is I have a really heavy, um, uh, heavy hand is not the word I want to use. A big component of my class is learning to find good resources. It's evaluating information accuracy. It's evaluating the sites. And so that I think is an equally important part to learning any of our disciplines, because when they go out in the world and they have questions about you know, medical questions, environmental questions, um, financial questions, how do they find that answer, right? So that's a big part of what I'm helping students here is, it's not about going to the textbook to find the answer, because there's not a textbook for, for your random question um, that, you know, grandma's asking you and you're trying to answer it. How do you find good question, uh, answers online? That's a big part of this. It helps me a lot with ongoing course improvements. I have, as I mentioned, I give students options in how they um, learn the information. There's the textbooks and videos. Um, quite often students in this section of the assignment will find amazing resources. And then I just wrap them into the resources I share with future students. So it's really helpful. Other benefits. It helps prevent cheating. As I mentioned, this started as a way to prevent cheating, um, but it became so much more in a way I wasn't expecting. The um, students are more likely to cheat with fewer high stakes assignments, right? So with this approach of authentic assessment where students are doing smaller assignments more often, 
and they're doing them in a way that makes sense for them, they're less likely to cheat. It's also really easy for me to figure out where students are getting the information from or, and this unfortunately happens, where a student will copy the answer from a source and then cite different sources. And, and you know, you can usually kind of start getting a sense of this doesn't seem like it's the student answer. And with this particular approach of the learning journal, I can go to the sources that they cited and it's pretty easy to see that like the source used this term, you use this term, odds are you didn't get this information from the source. And what's, what's really beautiful about the way that I can approach students because of the learning journal, I don't need to approach them with, I think you're cheating. I can approach them with the source you cited doesn't match the information you provide. Can you help me bridge that gap? And usually in the course of that conversation, the student will, will kind of have to tell me like, nope, that's not where I got it from. And then we can have the conversation. But it really makes it a lot easier for me to, um, to prevent cheating because it's pretty easy to see where students are not getting the information from the sources they cite. The, this approach of giving them options also helps me to see similarities between student work. Right. So if students are working together, um, it's a lot easier to see that, gosh, both of your essays look similar when they're not buried in 100 essays. Right. Or if they're they're both doing diagrams. One of the things I do offer for my students that has been really effective is if you have a friend in the class or you want to work together with another student, that's great. Just let me know. And your answers have to be in different formats. So if one of you writes an essay, the other has to draw a diagram. And that way, even though they're working together, they still have to demonstrate their own knowledge in a, in a slightly different way. And that's been really effective for encouraging collaboration and also helping prevent cheating. This has also been really helpful for um, AI concerns, right? Because like, like all of you, I'm sure, um, I've had students that just post my question into ChatGPT and copy the answer. Because of the, the learning journal though, they have to demonstrate where they got that information from. And you can actually take this to the next step and ask them to reference specific things um, in the book or in your lecture or um, ask them to include examples from the lecture or from the module. And this is, is you know, it's this, it's this thing of, I wanna prevent cheating, but I really don't like approaches where the entire purpose is to prevent cheating. And so it's about finding ways to make that useful as well as a way to combat cheating. And so asking them to connect the answer to something that you talked about in the lecture or something that was in the textbook makes it really hard for AI to do, but it's also helpful for students. So this semester for the first time, I'm trying um, a strategy where the learning journal is actually wrapping in AI. It's going okay. <laughs> I think in a few semesters I'll have this um, fine-tuned a little bit better and maybe I'll share. But here's here's what I'm currently doing. And it, it's a pretty good strategy for students that have, have tried this. For all of the assignment, one of the options, so again, that's that you can show me however you want, but one of the options is what I'm calling a fact-checking assignment. And what students do is they have to tell me this is the assignment they're doing. They're doing the fact-checking option. And they copy the answer from AI. We'll start there. Then they need to find reliable resources or information from the lecture that verifies each point that um, the AI is providing. And this has been a really great way to also teach them how to use AI, right? One of the, the concerns is you get back a beautiful answer and it sounds lovely, but um, sometimes it's just wrong, right? Like. AI will just make up citations and research articles that never actually happened. 
but because it's presented so holistically, it feels like that must all be correct. And it's got citations. They just don't exist, right? I can't remember what they call that, AI hallucination or something. And so what I'm teaching them here, again, these are all life skills in addition to learning biology. What I'm teaching them here is AI is giving you an answer. Now make sure it's right, right? Check each of the points. And, and I do ask them to verify from a citation. So they need to cite each, each point. You can take that to the next step and ask them to remove content that isn't in the class or add examples from the class. So this is helping them work with AI as a tool rather than lean on AI as a, as a crutch, right? Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. Any questions so far? I'm so glad that the, the fact checking option is um, is helpful. It's I've only had a few students try it and, it, and it's gone. It's gone pretty well. Yeah, the one thing I want to add is the removing information that isn't part of the assignment, because AI tends to give a really detailed example. And so those students got kind of stuck in some weeds because there was too much detail. So I might change it to ask them first step is remove all the stuff that contains vocabulary that we don't need. So, so glad that was helpful. Okay. So this is the last um, section because I know we're getting towards the end, but I, I kept mentioning this mysterious worksheet. So I'm actually gonna to show that to you. But before I do, a quick summary on the difference between authentic assessment and low impact assessment, or what I was calling traditional assessments. This is directly from um, one of the other CBC presentations. The, the proper citation is in the notes, so you'll have that. Um, this is not mine though, I wanted to be really clear about that. So authentic assessments require students to do something that demonstrates their knowledge and skills rather than the low impact assessment um, ask them to respond to questions, right? So it's the, the show and not tell piece of it. Um, authentic is more active rather than passive. Um, it helps students contextualize and apply the information to their own lives, right? That's the multiple means of engagement rather than having it just be kind of rote memory that exists in the in the bubble of the class and they're not used outside again. Um, it encourages deeper learning rather than more shallow learning. As I showed you, when students have to put information together, it really increases the rigor of what you're asking them to do rather than being good at guessing multiple choice. And it in inspires students to carry this information on into the real world because they can directly see how it connects. Um, another great example where I had students learn bones, um, again, a, a parent with their child drew a skeleton and they all labeled the bones, right? So this is all about how can I take this on into the future? Oh, very good. Authentic assessments fosters critical thinking, absolutely. Problem solving and increases metacognitive skills, yes. And so for, for I can't remember who was asking about how do we take this to our colleagues who may be resistant? Um, that, that's what we want to take to them, right? Authentic assessment isn't about making the course easier. In fact, it makes the course more rigorous because you're asking students to do more with the content. And I can ask them to do more with the content because I'm asking them to do less things that I'm not interested in teaching them, right? Yeah. Okay. So let me share this worksheet and I'm gonna put the link in the chat as well. So this is, um, 
it's it's just a, a little thing that I created to help us walk through how to create an authentic assessment because it can be it can be challenging. So the first thing you want to do is identify the learning outcome that you want to assess, right? This is where you want to be clear. This is really important. What do I want to assess? I want to assess that they can understand, that they can explain the nervous system. Okay. Identify your current assessment. I have them write an essay about the nervous system. And I should mention under each of these bullet points is a link to some really helpful resources. For the first one is understanding by design, which, um, is essentially how do you design your class using backwards design that students can see, right? So explaining to students, here's what you're going to learn really helps them learn it rather than go read chapter three, right? The hidden curriculum is a really wonderful um, reading about hidden curriculum. These are all the things that we assume students know that isn't part of what we're teaching them. So for example, I assumed that students know how to do comparative SAT questions. That's a hidden curriculum, right? When we assume that students know how to um, uh, create, you know, read through the textbook in a particular way, we need to train them how to read a textbook. That's not a, um, an inherent skill that everybody has unless they're taught. So that's that's definitely worth reading. If you haven't read the hidden curriculum, really good. Okay, so you, what's my outcome? How do I um, currently assess it? And what are some confounding variables? This one is, can be really difficult. And if you are working with your um, your colleagues, this is a great place to have broader discussions because we all have our blind spots. I won't be able to see the confounding variable unless someone tells me about it, right? Back to my multiple choice question. I had no idea that was something people didn't know. I wouldn't have seen that, that was a blind spot. So having a discussion more broadly can really help. And then identify three different ways students can demonstrate that. So this is like we, what we did for the, the nervous system. How else can you do it other than an essay? You can do a diagram, you can do a flowchart, whatever it might be. So how else can students demonstrate this. And that'll help you design the adaptable assessment. This is the uh, again the link to the tilt framework, which is a really wonderful way to help you design assessments that are clear for students. Because I will say when I first started um, doing these particular this particular strategy for assessments, I wasn't as good at explaining to students what I wanted them to do. It was a little too fluid. There wasn't quite enough information for students. Um, and the TILT framework will really help you um, design the assessment so students know what you're asking them to do. They also on their website have wonderful examples for each discipline. Um, in fact, I might encourage you for whoever was asking the math question, go to that site. They have examples from lots and lots of disciplines. I, I'd be willing to bet they have something for math. Questions on um, on this or on anything else in so far? Any thoughts folks are having? Things you were thinking about changing in your class? Um, Assignments that you're you're feeling particularly stuck on. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Our our own metacognitive um, practice. Um, opportunities to reflect are important. Oops. And yeah, that that slide at the end there has links to all of those that are also on the, the worksheet. Okay. 
So I am going to turn it over um, back to back to the CBC folks for wrapping us up. We actually have a little bit of time. So once we do that, we can maybe turn off the, the recording and you can ask those questions that you didn't want to ask during the recorded session. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So, and to all of you, thank you for attending this webinar and giving Suzanne your attention and us your time on a Friday. Once again, please look to the chat. So she just posted a link to the survey and complete it. Once again, the survey is set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses. So please be sure to click that button and because that can serve as verification of your attendance. If you experience any type of issues, for example, just seeing the webinar survey isn't enough for your institution, please reach out to support at cbc.edu. We also hope that you register for some of the other webinars that we're going to be offering throughout the term. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat for you right now. We've still got an exciting suite of webinars that are gonna take place all throughout April and one in early May. Lastly, this webinar and the associated slides will be available at the link that I posted in the chat. Please do bear with us because we do wanna make sure that our web or webinars are accessible. So that means that we need to take time to get them properly captioned and not using auto-generated text. So we're hoping that within the next few weeks, if not sooner, the webinar video will be available. And we'll also try to have the slide sooner. We're gonna go on and stop the recording now. So if you wanna linger back and ask any direct questions, Suzanne, you're welcome to. <laughs>